All right. So last week we spoke about this great topic called joy. Like who doesn't want to talk about joy, right? And now comes a question. Anybody did something, felt something, something happened different this week because of it? Anything dinged in your head or you remembered or you were focused? You could say no. You could say yes. Maybe something happened. Maybe you remembered to dance or to smile or to be positive or to remember your blessings. You know, we had a lot of different great ideas that we shared last week and they're all good ideas. And the challenge is to remember them. The challenge is to remember to do them. We spoke about, what were the great tips we said? We spoke about journaling. Thank you, God journals. Make it very tangible, your gratitude and what a blessed life you have. We spoke about understanding how worthwhile it is to be joyous and therefore being disciplined in your joy, being disciplined in things to create joy because it's so, so worth it. We spoke about rec recognizing God's miracles and God's kindnesses and God's blessings, being grateful, knowing it's true, knowing every single day God is showering on us kindnesses and wonders and miracles. We said, how do we know? Because that's what it says in the prayers. <laughs> So it's not my word, you don't have to believe me. It's what we literally say in our prayers three times a day. If you pray three times a day, you say it three times a day. God, thank you for the wonders. Thank you for the miracles. Thank you for the kindnesses of the day because it happens every, every single day. We spoke of noticing the good in your life, focusing on it and remembering, remembering times that were hard and how you got through and how you're getting through this as well. We spoke about shrinking the bad by putting it in perspective and rejoicing in the good in your life. So that was last week. Now that I reminded you what we did, I mean, that was a little bit of an overview, a little skimpy overview perhaps. And I'll say my question again, more people have come on since. Does anyone have something that was different this week because of last week's class? Anyone have something that they did differently, processed differently, thought about differently, experienced differently? because of everything we discussed last week. I started uh, a journal a, f a few weeks ago, online journal. I don't do it every day, but uh, most of the days, not, not every day. That's great. Um, what I did last week, um, I would think about, oh, well, this is a good, this is a blessing. And um, this thought would come to my mind and then I would start thinking about something else. Then I would stop and I, I would say to myself, no, I should emphasize this blessing and I, I should um, um, feel more joy for it. So I, I, that's the effort I was making this week. Not just um, saying to myself, oh, Hashem, it, it is a blessing, but uh, to, um, to, to make it longer, to, to, uh, to think Please, about it. Yeah, yeah, yes, to have more uh, feeling, good uh, feeling over it. So that, that was what I was doing this week. Well, that's amazing, Rifka, because that's exactly one of the things we spoke about, which I didn't review now, but we did speak about that. Like, be excited about the good in your life. Don't just say, yeah, I don't want to get too excited. I don't want to make myself too vulnerable. I don't want to get disappointed afterwards. You know, you get too happy and then you crash and all the stuff we tell ourselves. No, we want to be excited. We want to rejoice. We want to like full force really celebrate, celebrate the good. So thank you, Rifka, for remembering and for doing it. And we are looking at this idea of joy. And why are we talking about joy again? Because we are in the Jewish month of Adar. I explained Adar is the last month of the lunar year. And when there's a leap year, which happens seven in every 19 years, to realign the solar and lunar dimensions of our calendar, that we shouldn't slip away from the seasons, we have a second month of Adar. So we have 60 days of Adar. And we said 60 days of Adar is 60 days of joy. And we said when you have 60 days of joy, negativity is nullified because there's a concept in Jewish legal thought of things being nullified when you have 60 times as much of the other gender. So 60 times as much joy nullifies all negativity. So this is a great time to practice being joyous. Now, obviously, we all want, I don't have to convince anyone here, no, nah, I don't want to be joyous. Why would I bother? No, we all want. And we all know what to do. I mean, we spent the whole hour on it last week, and I don't think I said any great innovative thoughts. We all probably knew everything I said. We just had to remember. So the challenge is remembering. The challenge is figuring out a way that you're going to work on it. 
that you're not going to take it as status quo, that you're not going to view it as like, if I have it, I have it. If I don't, I don't. That you're not going to view it as a given, as an inalienable right. So therefore, if I don't have it, it's a question. But if I do have it, I don't even think about it. No, we're going to appreciate it. I know it's really worth working on joy. But sometimes we said it's hard to be joyous. Meaning, what was our basic point from last week? We would really synopsize all the ideas we said last week. The basic, basic underpinning of everything we said was, it's God. He loves us. He's good. This is good. And that's why one of the tools of which Rivka said she was doing a journal, which I highly recommend all the time, is look at your life and see it's good. Look at your life and appreciate the blessings. Look at your life and then look at your life and then look at your life and feel blessed. Feel taken care of. Feel nurtured by God. Feel nurtured by all the details of your life. And when you're in that space of feeling how blessed is my life, how good is my life, how miraculous is my life, life looks good. And then it's very natural to feel this joy. But the problem is sometimes there are things that are really, really, really hard, really difficult. We can't really process that as good. You know, some things you can put in perspective, even if it's really not good. Like um, if someone loses a job, that's pretty, pretty serious. But you could tell yourself, it's happened to me before and it's all turned out for the good. You could tell yourself, God was taking me out of this environment. It's actually quite toxic. You could tell yourself, God took me out of this job to give me a better job. So I think hopefully we all know, if you don't know, come see me. <laughs> but we probably can come up with different thoughts that make sense, that work in our brains of how even something like losing a job, which, you know, has serious financial repercussions, but how we can see it as good. I'm going to develop different parts of myself. That was a dead end job anyway. That wasn't healthy for me. That wasn't emotionally healthy. That wasn't stimulating. You know, we might all know stories of people that lost a job and got a better one or because they lost a job, they developed a whole new talent and succeeded far more than ever before. I mean, I know stories, you know stories. That happens to many, many, many people because God is good. And when things happen that seem bad, often God's goodness is going to shine very clearly. But then there are things that we can't really say those lines to ourselves. There are things that can't figure out what to say. They just don't seem good. And if we can't process it as good, how do we stay in our space of joy? If I can process what's going on in my life as good, I can be joyous in my great life. And if my life seems challenging, but I know because I spy all the blessings, I can process it as good and stay in my place of joy. And if things are happening that are seemingly clearly not good, like the example I just gave of losing a job, but I can figure out ways to package it and see how potentially there could be so much good here. So I can still work to stay in my place of joy. But sometimes there are things past my pay grade. I can't figure out any way to look at this and see it as positive. I can't. I just can't. I want to shrink the bad. I want to put it in perspective. I'm rejoicing the good. But this is just overwhelming me. And I don't see a way to see it as anything but not good. So sometimes when you're in that situation, we really just need to remember that we never can truly understand. By definition, God is beyond our understanding. We're very finite and God is very infinite. His thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. So in essence, he's ununderstandable, which means when I look at things in my life and it doesn't make sense to me, well, that makes sense. It's coming from God. And God's beyond my understanding. So it makes sense that what he does is also beyond my understanding. But at the same time, we want to try to understand because it helps us. I can understand the ununderstandable. If I can fathom God's infinity, it makes it easier for me to be joyous in the hard things in my life. And that's what we're talking about here is being joyous. Now, there's lots and lots of ways to understand this and we had spoke a few weeks ago about trust, then we spoke about some concepts there. So not wanting to repeat, I'm just going to bring in a few other angles. The verse says in Mishle, in Proverbs, es asher yehav havai The one who God loves, he rebukes. That doesn't seem to make sense. <laughs> Why are you rebuking the one you love? The one you love must be the one who's good and who's doing good and who's serving you. Why is he getting the rebuke? But we are told, and that's why I'm bringing this in here, that sometimes... God's rebuke, we would translate as a suffering, as hard things we go through, is actually part of God's 
love. It's part of God's kindness to us. And that's why the verse says, that's why Mishle, Proverbs written by King Solomon, why is this man of all times besides Mashiach, the Redeemer himself? He's telling us God loves us so much. And he sees that we have some things on record that need to be cleansed. And we're not cleansing them. Maybe it's we can't cleanse them. It's really difficult for us to cleanse. It's really deep stuff or it's from years past or for many years. And God knows us and God loves us. Now, of course, you could say, well, God loves everyone. And he does. But the more we reach out to him, the more we express our love for him by our service, by our feelings, by our actions, the more God can reciprocate and express his love for us. So here's a person that God's able to reciprocate. God can really express his love and this person sometimes is the one that's going to go through hard things. Because God says, I love you. You love me so much. I love you so much. And there are things that have to be cleansed. And out of love for you, I want them cleansed now. I want them cleansed in this world. Meaning there's this world and there's the next world the afterlife, the other world, the spiritual world. And in that spiritual realm, there's a whole dimension of cleansing, which in the Hebrew is called Gehenna, which is a world, a domain for the souls. There's nothing physical going on here. This is all spirituality. This is all souls, which is what we are. Our core is a soul. The soul, after a person passes away, sometimes needs to go through these purging processes because of whatever wrong was done during this lifetime or sometimes during a previous lifetime. And if deep wrong was done, there's deep cleansing that needs to happen. And that's fine and that's good and that's also God's kindness and love. Because the point of the cleansing is to be able to really connect to God eternally in the realm of reward. And to be able to be in that realm and bask in God's love and expression and rays of godly energy, you first need to go through the cleansing process. So the cleansing process itself it's an expression of God's love for us. It's allowing us to have eternal reward, eternal relationship with him without any barriers because we cleanse them all. But even still, God says, you know, that cleansing is hard. That cleansing isn't easy for the soul to bear. Why is it so hard? Because the next world is the world of God's judgment. In a world of judgment, you get what you deserve. And a world of judgment, to be cleansed takes exactly how much it takes to clean. But this world, our lifetime, this world that we live in is a world of compassion, is a world where you don't have to get what you deserve. You can get far better. And part of the far better is you don't need the intensity of scouring to clean off whatever barriers have accrued that would be a blockage between you and God. You don't need it very quickly very quickly. We can cleanse and remove so much garbage that's a barrier between us and God because this is a world of compassion. And in a world of compassion, a little suffering goes a long way. A little cleansing can create enormous, enormous, enormous purging of any of the barriers between us and God. So who gets this cleansing in this world. Wow, it sounds so like uh, American style. You get the most bang for your buck. You're doing a little cleansing and getting so clean. Who gets this? So King Solomon is saying, those who God loves, those who are really expressing their love of God, and therefore they're meriting that God can cleanse them in this world instead of in the afterlife. And that's how one of the ways it's only one of the ways, but it is a way to understand and sometimes reframe when we're going through something hard and understand this, this too is God's love. It's not what we want. We don't ask for it. We don't say, okay, God, for sure I need cleansing. So do it now because it's much better now than later. No, we don't say that. We say, God, you're all compassionate. Forget this cleansing piece. Just give us good, give us revealed good. It's all good, but we want revealed good. Give us compassion. With your compassion, cleanse me without any suffering on my part. We never ask for pain. We never do. We know that God can do anything, and if he wants, he can bend the rules enough and cleanse us without the suffering. So we say, God, just be completely compassionate. Just give it to us. We don't deserve it. Fine, we're your child. We're your only child. Every Jew is your only child. What wouldn't you do for your only child? We want to be your spoiled only child. 
We want you to give us freely and totally beyond anything we deserve. No problem. Come on, God. Just shower us with your love and your compassion and take care of it. That's what we ask for. We want revealed good. But if a person is in a situation where there is this happening already, this is how we process it. So I I said that very strongly because I really want to emphasize that point. We never ask God to cleanse us and scour us in this world so we don't have to deal with it in the next world. We never ask for scouring at all. We say, God, revealed good. You are capable. Your compassion is infinite. Just give us revealed good. But if we're going through something that doesn't seem like revealed good, this is a way we could frame it. The author Ibn Tanya discusses this concept and he compares it to the movement of the sun 90 million miles away from our planet in contrast to the movement of the shadows cast by the sun. So the shadows are moving in planet Earth a few inches and the sun 90 million miles away could be moving hundreds and hundreds of miles that's creating that shift of a few inches in our world. And the author ever says that's cleansing in this world and cleansing in the next world. What in this world is a few inches and the next world is hundreds and hundreds of miles to create the same effect. And that's why we accept when it happens in this world, but we never ask for it. There's a, a vignette I've shared with you of the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe. I know I've shared this before, where this was before his imprisonment in 1927 under the very, very, very rabid communists of that era. Where they took him in for interrogation and they were quite not happy with him. And the interrogator pulled out a gun and he said to him, you see this little toy? This little toy has made a lot of people talk. And the previous Lubavitcher ever responded, your toy only works for people who have one world and many gods. But I have one God and two worlds. For me, your toy is not going to work. Decoded, what he meant was, for people that have all these different gods they serve, they want this, then they want this, and they want this, and the only world of the of their existence is this world, they get scared by a gun. They don't want to lose this pleasure. They don't want to lose this. And they don't want to lose this honor, money, position, whatever it is. And there's nothing in their life besides the now. So they get scared by that little toy. But the previous Rebbe said, me, I've got one God. I'm only serving God. So I'm sticking with him and I'm bouncing around and I have two worlds. There's this world, but there's also the next world. And that next world is as real to me as this world. You want to take away this world? You can't take away the next world. And that's why your toy doesn't scare me. So that's really our reality. If we really get this idea that there's two worlds and one God, If something is happening harsh in this world, God's doing it to save us from the next world. But we're not looking for harshness in this world either. Now, when you say this story, the previous Rebbe, and he was interrogated in 1927, it's like, all right, well, that's a Rebbe. That's a great, great leader of world Jewry. That story has like nothing to do with me because I'm not a Rebbe. So a woman I know, she passed away recently. Her name is Judy Silver. Allah Shalom. She told me a very similar story with her father. Her father, this woman who I know, who passed away. Her father, when the Nazis came to power, he somehow got it. He understood the whole story. He saw exactly what was going to happen. And he knew he had to save, to save his family, he had, they had to get out of there. They were in Hungary. And very interesting, I'm not gonna tell you the whole story. Everyone thought he was crazy. His wife thought he was crazy. He said, we're moving, we're leaving. We're going to France. They're like, France, that's a totally secular place. And we don't know French and we don't know the people. And here we have our family and our jobs. And, and some people were telling her mother to divorce her father because this is nuts. He's obviously nuts. And she went to the rabbis and said, no, don't divorce your husband, stick with him. So the father, the mother, Judy, and her, her, her siblings, they went to France. And then everything her father unfortunately saw would happen with Hitler happened. And then they realized he wasn't so crazy and that many things happened. They, 
So when they're in France, but her father realizes that's not safe enough, which it wasn't, and we got to get out, but then we don't have any money. And they managed whatever, long story, her, her mother looked completely Aryan, blonde haired, blue eyed, and she would go to Germany to help to get out the money of the German Jews that ran away but couldn't take their money. And through this, they earned some money. And in the end of the day, I'm skipping a million details, they got to Santa, Santa Domingo. They found this country in South America, right, Central America, Santa Domingo, that would take them in. So here they are. Now, this is during the war, but they don't know what's going on in Europe. I mean, they know there's a war, but they don't really know what's going on. They didn't realize the extent of the Holocaust, but they're in Santa Domingo. And she's, she's a rabbi. I mean, her husband, her, not her, her father's a rabbi. So he starts doing whatever he can to help the Jews, whatever they were of Santo Domingo. So there's this Jew in the northern end of the island. He gets the father to come. He made up a whole story. He brings him to his tent. This man, who was originally from Europe, was living with a native woman. He put a rifle. She was with him. She came with her father to Santa Domingo, to this northern end of Santo Domingo. He put a rifle to her father's head and he said, make for me a chuppah. My mother of blessed memory, she said I had to get married with a chuppah. So make for me a chuppah with this woman. Now, obviously you can't make a chuppah with a woman who's not Jewish. Um, and this guy was pointing a rifle to his head. And that's pretty scary. It's a rifle and he would shoot. And somehow he just kept his cool. He said, okay, let's start drinking. Let's start celebrating. And her father had a drink and the man had a drink and then her father had another drink and the man had another drink. And basically her father kept drinking with the man until the man fell asleep drunk. I don't know how her father kept his head with all that liquor but somehow he and his daughter escaped. How, how did he do that? As he was really focused, I've got one God. I cannot make a chuppah for this guy. I've got one God. Whatever he's gonna do, I cannot make a chuppah for him. I've got one God. And somehow God helped him and he figured out a way to get out of that, extricate himself from that situation. I was just saying that because this concept of one God and two worlds is applicable for all of us. It's not just applicable for a Rebbe, a leader of world Jewry, a perfectly righteous, godly person. I'm not so perfectly righteous and godly. I'm a human being who's trying. But we all can relate to this concept. Whatever's going on in our life, we have one God and two worlds. We have one God, one God, meaning if we're aware of what's real, if we're aware of the only things that matter, of what's true and real and eternal, we're not scared. Not only are we not scared by a rifle, a pistol, a toy, death, we're not scared by life. We're not scared. We know there's one God. We know everything is coming from God. We know what could seem to be a tragedy could be the greatest help for a person. There's one God and everything is coming from that one God. So obviously it's a lot easier to say this when you're in the comfort of your living room and I am of mine. <laughs> And to hold your head when you're in Santo Domingo and someone's putting a rifle to your uh, temple is a lot more impressive, but it's really true for all of us. We have one God. We have one God. And when we keep that in mind and we use that as the filter through which we filter through and process what's happening in life and the choices we make and what we do, we have one God. Is this as per that only reality that's important, that only reality that's true, not, I have one God, the other stuff doesn't really matter. Now, obviously, everything I'm saying is not to try to explain tragedies 
I'm not trying to explain tragedies. I would say it's wrong to explain a tragedy. You know, we, we speak about, can you explain why bad things happen to good people, right? That's a classical question. The sages discuss it over 1900 years ago. You know, why do bad things happen to good people? And Jonathan Sachs, Allah Shalom, the chief rabbi of the whole British Commonwealth, who was a very brilliant man and said many things that really stick in your mind. So he said, you can't explain why bad things happen to good people because God set it up this way so we should be able to legitimately complain to him. If we understood, we couldn't complain the same way. And it's good that we can honestly, sincerely complain. Meaning, if we understood everything, if we understood why God is doing this and why God is doing that and why is this happening and why is, right? So many times we want to know. And why is this happening and why is this happening? It would all make sense. It does all make sense. God does know exactly what he's doing. And God is doing everything out of love for us. So if we really understood it, it would be like, okay, it makes sense. I understand. But we don't want it to make sense. We don't want to understand. We want to complain. We want to complain to God. We want to say, God, this is not fair. God, why are you doing this? What is going on? I, I actually recently, I, it was actually very painful for me. I, I met someone I know who was going through a tremendous, tra tremendous, tremendous hard, hard thing. And I was, I felt so broken by the pain she was having. And I said to her, I said, you're not allowed to say this, but I am. I said, God, why are you doing this to her? This woman is such a good person. She is trying so hard to serve you. Why are you doing this? I told her, you're not allowed to say it. I'm saying it for you. I'm allowed to say it. You're not, but I am. And that was this point that, that Jonathan Sachs was alluding to here. For yourself, you're not allowed to say that to God. You're not allowed to say, God, what are you doing? What are you thinking? Why are you making me suffer this way? You're not allowed to say this. But for someone else, you are, and God wants you to, and it's a good thing, and it will help the situation. So if everything was so clear, and we understood it all, and it all made perfect sense, we couldn't complain to God about why is this person suffering and why is this person suffering? So God makes it obscure. It's not so obvious to us why this all is fair. That's good. Then we can complain. There's a, a famous Hasidic story of, um, it's a long story, but I'll say super briefly, of a person who, long story, I'm trying to think how I'm going to say it really briefly, but there's a person and he, we know the story because it's Semach Tzedek, the third Lubavitcher Rebbe, once said to some of his followers, would you like me to tell you a Tyra? Or would you like me to tell you a story? So they said, surprise, surprise, a story. <laughs> so this is a story he told them. He said there was a man. And long story, very brief. The man was a wealthy man. And he was asked by his spiritual leader to money, to lend money, to lend money to a person, to lend money to a person, and he kept lending the money and the person wouldn't pay him back. And then there came a point where the guy said, I can't do it anymore. I can't lend you this lend, you know, lend that you never get back. I can't keep lending you this money. Well, the man went to the spiritual leader and he said, he's not lending me the money. And then the spiritual leader, the Rebbe said, no, please lend him the money. All right. He lent him the money again. Then it happened again. He's like, no. And the spiritual leader told him to lend the money. He said, I can't, I just can't. And he did not Anyway, fast forward many years, he passes away and he goes up to the heavenly courts and the heavenly courts said, this is a horrible thing you did. You had money and your spiritual leader, your Rebbe said to lend the money and you didn't listen. He's like, what are you talking about? I listened so many times. It was after many, many times of listening that I didn't listen. They're like, no, you didn't listen. This is really bad. This is, this is, this is going to take a lot of cleansing. He said, not fair. Heavenly courts, you don't get it. You weren't human. You weren't on planet earth. You don't know the value of money. You don't get it. So he said, okay, that's a valid point. 
So they found three great sages that had lived on planet Earth and since have passed away. And they said, okay, let them judge the case. And they judged and they found him guilty. He said, not fair. <laughs> You've lived on planet Earth a long time ago. You forgot what money means. I need to be judged by people who are on planet Earth now. And then the Semel Tzedek turned to his followers, to his Hasidim and said, what do you think? What should be his, his judgment? And they realized that this was happening right now. And they were the court and they were judging the soul. And they all said, innocent, innocent. He's completely innocent. And the Rebbe said, yes. The Semel Tzedek said, yes. I also think he was innocent. And that is how he was judged. Why did I bring that in? Sort of a butchered, fast version of a long story. For us to understand the idea that sometimes things only work a certain way in this world. And in the, second, the next world, things look very different. But we are in this world. And we look at this world. And therefore, we accept everything in this world from a blade of grass to the most humongous tragedies our people have experienced. We say, it's all the hand of God. We say God has his reasons that we don't understand because his wisdom is infinite and we can't understand infinity. But not understanding the reasons doesn't remove the reality that there are reasons. I don't know if anyone here has experienced this or remembers going through something that was painful and we were trying to wrap your head around it. Like what is going on? Why is this happening? And sometimes as you like, think about it and you say, well, this is part of God's infinite, inexplicable wisdom. This is part of God's infinite, inexplicable love for me. And then it started to make sense or the pain was lessening. The pain got less as you focused on that idea that this is, this is part of God's love for me. I don't see it as love. I don't understand it, but I know this is part of his love. And just holding on to that thought made it easier. I don't know if any of you have experienced that in terms of yourself, in terms of really looking when you're going through a hard time and saying, I don't make any sense to me, but I know it's love. Not a love I'm looking for per se, but obviously God knows what he's doing. And obviously I'm human, so I don't understand, but I know this is part of his love. Sometimes, if you didn't think of it then, it's even something, it's even an exercise you can do afterwards. Meaning you can think back to things that were really painful that you experienced oh. and you could think of them oh. and holding your heart as you think of that thing, this is part of God's love. I don't understand it. It's beyond me. It's inexplicable to me. But if I'm really, really holding that pain and holding, this is part of God's love. It lessens the pain. Oh. Just holding in your heart, holding the pain and wrapping it around with, this is part of God's love. This is part of God's wisdom. This is part of his love. And as you hold it and wrap it with those thoughts, it literally can lessen the pain. So our bottom line is we want to be in a state of joy. Everything is coming from God. God is good which means all that happens is in essence good, sometimes openly perceived, sometimes disguised, don't see it now, sometimes don't see it afterwards also, but still in essence good, in essence God, in essence good. Why is he doing this? As I referenced before the story of the Magad of Mezrich, of the father that hid himself, and his child was supposed to look for him. And the wise son looks and looks until he finds him. And sometimes the children don't look. 
They just start crying. They're like, where's my father? Where's my father? You're supposed to be looking for him. There's, a, there's actually a story of a child who was playing hide and seek. And he was hiding and he hid so well that everyone stopped looking for him. That actually once happened to me when I was a child playing hide and seek. I remember exactly where I was hiding. It was a great hiding place. I must have been very small to fit in there. And it was such a good hiding place that everyone got tired of the game because they never found me. It was really boring. But in this alternate version, the boy started crying and his father came by and said, why are you crying? And he said, because my friends, I was hiding and my friends stopped looking for me. And his father, the Magad of Mezer, said, God has the same complaint. God hides that we should look for him. But sometimes we get busy with other things. And sometimes we forget to keep looking. We don't want to have those challenges. We don't want to have to even deal with understanding how we're supposed to process those challenges. We want to be able to look at our life, see the blessings, use those blessings to look at the whole picture of our life, and say, thank you, God, for my very good life. That's what we want, and that's what every one of us should have. And especially now, in this Adar time, I said it's a 60-day era of joy. So we're all going to work hard on creating joy. Because when we create it now, which is officially should be the easiest time to create it. It shouldn't just be for these 60 days. It should carry over because we want, we deserve, and we need to have a life of joy.